The V-2, technical name Agregat-4, was the world's first long-range ballistic missile. The liquid propellant rocket was developed during the Second World War in Germany as a vengeance weapon, designed to attack Allied cities as a form of retaliation for the ever-increasing Allied bomber effort against German cities. The V-2 rocket was also the first man-made object to enter the fringes of space. Beginning in September 1944, over 3,000 V-2s were launched by the German Wehrmacht against Allied targets during the war, mostly London and later Antwerp and Lea GE. According to a BBC documentary in 2011, the attacks resulted in the deaths of an estimated 9,000 civilians and military personnel, while 12,000 forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners were killed producing the weapons. The V-2's greatest impact may have been after the war. As Germany collapsed, teams from all of the Allied forces raced to collect rockets, designs and the German engineers and scientists involved in the V-2 effort. In the immediate post-war era, these teams were combined with local groups to re-engineer and update the V-2 design. The knowledge gained from these efforts led to rapid progress, especially in the United States and the Soviet Union, and by the mid-1950s, nuclear-armed descendants of V-2 missiles were common battlefield weapons. By the end of the decade these had reached intercontinental range and became a primary strategic weapon. Through a lengthy sequence of events, a significant portion of the original V-2 team ended up working for the U.S. Army at the Redstone Arsenal. This team, led by Werner von Braun, would be turned over to NASA on its formation. For NASA they designed a series of booster rockets in the Saturn family, which successfully landed a man on the moon. Developmental history In the late 1920s, a young Werner von Braun bought a copy of Hermann Oberth's book, Die Raket zu den Planeten Recurrency Human. Starting in 1930, he attended the Technical University of Berlin, where he assisted Oberth in liquid-fueled rocket motor tests. Von Braun was working on his doctorate when the Nazi Party gained power in Germany. An artillery captain, Walter Dornberger, arranged an Ordnance Department research grant for von Braun, who from then on worked next to Dornberger's existing solid-fuel rocket test site at Kummersdorf. Von Braun's thesis, Construction theoretical, and experimental solution to the problem of the liquid propellant rocket, was kept classified by the German army and was not published until 1960. By the end of 1934, his group had successfully launched two rockets that reached heights of 2.2 and 3.5 km. At the time, Germany was highly interested in American physicist Robert H. Goddard's research. Before 1939, German scientists occasionally contacted Goddard directly with technical questions. Von Braun used Goddard's plans from various journals and incorporated them into the building of the Aggregat series of rockets, named for the German for mechanism or mechanical system. Following successes at Kummersdorf with the first two Aggregat series rockets, Werner von Braun and Walter Riddle began thinking of a much larger rocket in the summer of 1936, based on a projected 25-metric-ton thrust engine. After the A-4 project was postponed due to unfavorable aerodynamic stability testing of the A-3 in July 1936, von Braun specified the A-4 performance in 1937, and, after an extensive series of test firings of the A-5 scale test model, using a motor redesigned from the troublesome A-3s by Walter Thiel, a4 design and construction was ordered C 1938-1939. During 28 Euro September 30, 1939, Der Tag der Weisheit conference met at PNEMA one quarter NDE to initiate the funding of university research to solve rocket problems. By late 1941, the Army Research Center at PNEMA one quarter NDE possessed the technologies essential to the success of the A4. The four key technologies for the A4 were large liquid fuel rocket engines, supersonic aerodynamics, gyroscopic guidance and rudders in jet control. At the time, Adolf Hitler was not particularly impressed by the V2. He pointed out that it was merely an artillery shell with a longer range and much higher cost. In early September 1943, Von Braun promised the Long Range Bombardment Commission that the A-4 development was practically complete concluded, but even by the middle of 1944, 
a complete A4 parts list was still unavailable. Hitler was sufficiently impressed by the enthusiasm of its developers, and needed a wonder weapon to maintain German morale, so authorized its deployment in large numbers. The V2s were constructed at the Mittwerk site by prisoners from Mittelbau Dora, a concentration camp where an estimated 20,000 prisoners died during the war. Technical details The A4 used a 75% ethanol water mixture for fuel and liquid oxygen for oxidizer. At launch the A4 propelled itself for up to 65 seconds on its own power, and a program motor controlled the pitch to the specified angle at engine shutdown, after which the rocket continued on a ballistic freefall trajectory. The rocket reached a height of 80 km after shutting off the engine. The fuel and oxidizer pumps were steam turbines, and the steam was produced by concentrated hydrogen peroxide with sodium permanganate catalyst. Both the alcohol and oxygen tanks were an aluminium-magnesium alloy. The combustion burner reached a temperature of 2500 Euro 2700 AA degree Celsius. The alcohol water fuel was pumped along the double wall of the main combustion burner. This regenerative cooling heated the fuel and cooled the combustion chamber. The fuel was then pumped into the main burner chamber through 1224 nozzles, which assured the correct mixture of alcohol and oxygen at all times. Small holes also permitted some alcohol to escape directly into the combustion chamber, forming a cooled boundary layer that further protected the wall of the chamber, especially at the throat where the chamber was narrowest. The boundary layer alcohol ignited in contact with the atmosphere, accounting for the long, diffuse exhaust plume. By contrast, later, Post V2 engine designs not employing this alcohol boundary layer cooling show a translucent plume with shock diamonds. The V2 was guided by four external rudders on the tail fins, and four internal graphite vanes at the exit of the motor. The LEV3 guidance system consisted of two free gyroscopes for lateral stabilization, and a PIGA accelerometer to control engine cutoff at a specified velocity. The V2 was launched from a pre-surveyed location, so the distance and azimuth to the target were known. Fin 1 of the missile was aligned to the target azimuth. Some later V2s used guide beams, radio signals transmitted from the ground, to keep the missile on course, but the first models used a simple analog computer that adjusted the azimuth for the rocket, and the flying distance was controlled by the timing of the engine cutoff, wrench lass, ground controlled by a Doppler system or by different types of onboard integrating accelerometers. The rocket stopped accelerating and soon reached the top of the approximately parabolic flight curve. Dr. Friedrich Kirchtein of Siemens of Berlin developed the V2 radio control for motor cutoff. For velocity measurement, Professor Wollmann of Dresden created an alternative of his Doppler tracking system in 1940 41 which used a ground signal transponded by the A-4 to measure the velocity of the missile. By February 9, 1942, Pierre Nemo one-quarter NDE engineer de Beek had documented the radio interference area of a V-2 as 10,000 meters around the firing point, and the first successful A-4 flight on October 3, 1943, used radio control for Brench Lass. Although Hitler commented on September 22, 1943 that it is a great load off our minds that we have dispensed with the radio guiding beam. Now no opening remains for the British to interfere technically with the missile in flight, about 20% of the operational V-2 launches were beam guided. The Operation Penguin V-2 offensive began on September 8, 1944. When Lure und Versuch Spiteri No. 444 launched a single rocket guided by a radio beam directed at Paris. Wreckage of combat V2s occasionally contain the transponder for velocity and fuel cut off. The painting of the operational V2s was mostly a camouflage ragged pattern with several variations, but at the end of the war, a plain olive green rocket also appeared. During tests, the rocket was painted in a characteristic black and white chessboard pattern which aided in determining if the rocket was spinning around its longitudinal axis. The original German designation of the rocket was V-2, unhyphenated, but U.S. publications such as Life magazine were using the hyphenated form V-2 as early as December 1944. This hyphenated form has now become common usage. Testing 
The first successful test flight was on October 3, 1942. This third day of October, 1942, is the first of a new era in transportation, that of space travel. A Euro speech at PNEMA 1 quarter NDE, Walter Dornberger, October 3, 1942-17. Two test launches were recovered by the Allies, the Bar Currency CKEBO rocket which landed in Sweden on June 13, 1944 and one recovered by the Polish resistance on May 30, 1944 from Blyzer and transported to the UK during Operation Most 3. Test launches of V-2 rockets were made at PNEMA 1 quarter NDE, Blyzer and Tuckola Forest, and after the war at Cuxhaven by the British, White Sands Proving Grounds, Cape Canaveral and Capustinia. Various design issues were identified and solved during V-2 development and testing. To reduce tank pressure and weight, high floater bow pumps were used to boost pressure. A short and lighter combustion chamber without burn-through was developed by using centrifugal injection nozzles, a mixing compartment, and a converging nozzle to the throat for homogeneous combustion. Film cooling was used to prevent burn through at the nozzle throat. Relay contacts were made more durable to withstand vibration and prevent thrust cutoff just after liftoff. Ensuring that the fuel pipes had tension free curves reduced the likelihood of explosions at 1,200 a Euro 1,800 am. Fins were shaped with clearance to prevent damage as the exhaust jet expanded with altitude. To control trajectory at liftoff and supersonic speeds, Heat-resistant graphite vanes were used as rudders in the exhaust jet. Airburst problem, through mid-March 1944, only four of the 26 successful Blizzard launches had satisfactorily reached the Sarnaki target area due to in-flight breakup on re-entry into the atmosphere. Initially, excessive alcohol tank pressure was suspected, but by April 1944 after five months of test firings, the cause was still not determined. Major General Rossman, the Army Weapons Office Department Chief, recommended stationing observers in the target area in Euro C. May June, Dornberger and von Braun set up a camp at the center of the Poland target zone. After moving to the Heidekraut, SS Mortar Battery 500 of the 836th Artillery Battalion was ordered on August 30 to begin test launches of 80 sleeved rockets. Testing confirmed that the so-called tin trousers a Euro a tube designed to strengthen the forward end of the rocket-clad Dinga Euro reduced the likelihood of airbursts. Production A production line was nearly ready at PNEMA 1 quarter NDE when the Operation Hydra attack caused the Germans to move production to the Mittelwerk in the Kahnstein where 5,200 V-2 rockets were built. Launch Sites Following Operation Crossbow Bombing Initial plans for launching from the massive underground Watkin and Wise Aaron's bunkers or from fixed pads such as near the Chateau du Molay were dropped in favor of mobile launching. Eight main storage dumps were planned and four had been completed by July 1944. The missile could be launched practically anywhere, roads running through forests being a particular favorite. The system was so mobile and small that only one mile a wagon was ever caught in action by Allied aircraft. During the Operation Bodenplatt attack on January 1, 1945 near Lotcham by a USAAF Fourth Fighter Group aircraft, although Raymond Baxter described flying over a site during a launch and his wingman firing at the missile without hitting it. It was estimated that a sustained rate of 350 V-2s could be launched per week, with 100 per day at maximum effort, given sufficient supply of the rockets. Operational History after Hitler's August 29, 1944 declaration to begin V-2 attacks as soon as possible, the offensive began on September 8, 1944 with a single launch at Paris, which caused modest damage near Porti d'Italy. Two more launches by the 485th followed, including one from The Hague against London on the same day at 6.43 p.m. A Euro the first landed at Chiswick, killing 63-year-old Mrs. Ada Harrison, three-year-old Rosemary Clark and Sapper Bernard Browning on leave from the Royal Engineers. Upon hearing the double crack of the supersonic rocket, Duncan Sands and Reginald Victor Jones looked up from different parts of the city and exclaimed that was a rocket. And a short while after the double crack, the sky was filled with the sound of a heavy body rushing through the air. As the V-2 explosions came without warning, 
the British government initially attempted to conceal their cause by blaming them on defective gas mains. However, the public was not fooled and soon began sardonically referring to the V2s as flying gas pipes. The Germans themselves finally announced the V-2 on November 8, 1944 and only then, on November 10, 1944, did Winston Churchill inform Parliament, and the world, that England had been under rocket attack for the last few weeks. Positions of the German launch units did change a number of times. For example artillery unit 444 arrived in the southwest Netherlands in September 1944. From a field near the village of Saruskirk, five V-2s were launched on 15th and 16th September, with one more successful and one failed launch on the 18th. That same date, a transport carrying a missile took a wrong turn and ended up in Saruskirk itself, giving a villager the opportunity to surreptitiously take some photographs of the weapon. These were smuggled to London by the Dutch resistance. After that the unit moved to Gasterland in the northwest Netherlands, to ensure that the technology did not fall into Allied hands. From Gasterland V-2s were launched against Ipswich and Norwich from September 25. Because of their inaccuracy, these V-2s did not hit their target cities. Shortly after that only London and Antwerp remained as designated targets as ordered by Adolf Hitler himself, Antwerp being targeted in the period of 12 to October 20, after which time the unit moved to The Hague. Over the next few months the number of V-2s fired was at least 3,172, distributed over the various targets as follows, Belgium, 1664, Antwerp, Lea G.E., Hasselt, Tournai, Mons, Diest, United Kingdom, 1402, London, Norwich, P289 Ipswich, France, 76, Lille, Paris, Tourcoing, Arras, Cambrai, Netherlands, 19, Maastricht, Germany, 11, Remagen, an estimated 2,754 civilians were killed in London by V-2 attacks with another 6,523 injured, which is two people killed per V-2 rocket. However, this understates the potential of the V-2, since many rockets were misdirected and exploded harmlessly. Accuracy increased over the course of the war particularly on batteries where Litstrial guide beam apparatus was installed. Missile strikes were often devastating, causing large numbers of deaths a Euro 160 killed and 108 seriously injured in one explosion on November 25, 1944 in mid-afternoon, striking a Woolworths department store in New Cross, southeast London. After these deadly results, British intelligence leaked falsified information implying that the rockets were overshooting their London target by 10 to 20 miles. This tactic worked and for the remainder of the war. Most landed on less heavily populated areas in Kent due to erroneous recalibration. The final two rockets exploded on March 27, 1945. One of these was the last V-2 to kill a British civilian, Mrs. Ivy Millishamp, aged 34, killed in her home in Kynaston Road, Orpington and Kent. Antwerp, Belgium was also the target for a large number of V-weapon attacks from October 1944 through March 1945, leaving 1,736 dead and 4,500 injured in Greater Antwerp. Thousands of buildings were damaged or destroyed as the city was struck by 590 direct hits. The largest loss of life in a single attack came on December 16, 1944, when the roof of a crowded cinema was struck, leaving 567 dead and 291 injured. A scientific reconstruction carried out in 2010 demonstrated that the B-2 creates a crater 20 a.m. wide and 8 a.m. deep, ejecting approximately 3,000 tons of material into the air. Countermeasures Big Ben and Crossbow, unlike the V-1, the V-2's speed and trajectory made it practically invulnerable to anti-aircraft guns and fighters, as it dropped from an altitude of 100 to Euro 110 a km at up to three times the speed of sound at sea level. Nevertheless, the threat of what was then codenamed Big Ben was great enough that efforts were made to seek countermeasures. The situation was similar to the pre-war concerns about manned bombers and led to a similar solution, the formation of the Crossbow Committee to collect examine and develop countermeasures. Early on, it was believed that the V-2 employed some form of radio guidance, 
a belief that persisted in spite of several rockets being examined without discovering anything like a radio receiver. This led to efforts to jam this non-existent guidance system as early as September 1944, using both ground and air-based jammers flying over the UK. In October a group had been sent to jam the missiles during launch. By December it was clear these systems were having no obvious effect, and jamming efforts ended. AAA system, Frederick Alfred Pyle, commander of Anti-Aircraft Command, studied the problem and proposed that enough anti-aircraft guns were available to produce a barrage of fire in the rocket's path, but only if provided with a reasonable prediction of the trajectory. The first estimates suggested that 320,000 shells would have to be fired for each rocket. About 2% of these were expected to fall back to the ground, almost 90 tons of rams, which would cause far more damage than the missile. At an August 25, 1944 meeting of the Crossbow Committee, the concept was rejected. Pyle continued studying the problem, and returned with a proposal to fire only 150 shells at a single rocket, with those shells using a new fuse that would greatly reduce the number that fell back to Earth unexploded. Some low-level analysis suggested that this would be successful against 1 in 50 rockets, provided that accurate trajectories were forwarded to the gunners in time. Work on this basic concept continued and developed into a plan to deploy a large number of guns in Hyde Park that were provided with pre-computed firing data for 2.5-mile wide grids of the London area. After the trajectory was determined, the guns would aim and fire between 60 and 500 rounds. At a crossbow meeting on January 15 Pyle's updated plan was presented with some strong advocacy from Roderick Hill and Charles Drummond Ellis. However, the committee suggested that a test not be carried out as no technique for tracking the missiles with sufficient accuracy had yet been developed. By March this had changed significantly, with 81% of incoming missiles correctly allotted to the grid square each fell into, or the one beside it. At a March 26 meeting the plan moved ahead, and Pyle was directed to a subcommittee with R. V. Jones and Ellis to further develop the statistics. Three days later the team returned a report stating that if the guns fired 2,000 rounds at a missile there was a 1 in 60 chance of shooting it down. Plans for an operational test began, but as Pyle later put it, Monty beat us to it, as the attacks ended with the Allied liberation of their launching areas. With the loss of the launching sites, the Germans turned their attention on Antwerp. Plans were made to move the Pyle system to protect that city, but the war ended before anything could be done. Direct attack, another defense against the V-2 campaign was to destroy the launch infrastructure a euro expensive in terms of bomber resources and casualties a euro, or to cause the Germans to aim at the wrong place through disinformation. The British were able to convince the Germans to direct V-1s and V-2s aimed at London to less populated areas east of the city. This was done by sending deceptive reports on the damage caused and sites hit via the German espionage network in Britain, which was controlled by the British. There is a record of one V-2, fortuitously observed at launch from a passing American consolidated B-24 Liberator, being shot down by .50-inch machine gun fire. On March 3, 1945 the Allies attempted to destroy V-2s and launching equipment in the Hogs Boss and the Hague by a large-scale bombardment, but due to navigational errors the Beswieten outquarter was destroyed, killing 511 Dutch civilians. Assessment, the German V-weapons cost $3 billion and were more costly than the Manhattan Project that produced the atomic bomb. 6,048 V-2s were built at a cost of approximately 100,000 Reichsmarks, each. 3,225 were launched. SS General Hans Kammler, who as an engineer had constructed several concentration camps including Auschwitz, had a reputation for brutality and had originated the idea of using concentration camp prisoners as slave laborers in the rocket program. The V-2 is perhaps the only weapon system to have caused more deaths by its production than its deployment. The V-2 consumed a third of Germany's fuel alcohol production and major portions of other critical technologies. To distill the fuel alcohol for one V-2 launch required 30 tons of potatoes at a time when food was becoming scarce. Due to a lack of explosives, 
concrete was used and sometimes the warhead contained photographic propaganda of German citizens who had died in Allied bombing. The V-2 lacked a proximity fuse, so it could not be set for air burst. It buried itself in the target area before or just as the warhead detonated. This reduced its effectiveness. Furthermore, its early guidance systems were too primitive to hit specific targets and its costs were approximately equivalent to four-engined bombers, which were more accurate, had longer ranges, carried many more warheads, and were reusable. Moreover, it diverted resources from other, more effective programs. That said, the limiting factor for German aviation after 1941 was always the availability of high-test aviation gas so criticisms of the V-1 and V-2 programs that compare their cost to hypothetical increases in fighter or bomber production are misguided. Nevertheless, the weapon had a considerable psychological effect because, unlike bombing planes or the V-1 flying bomb, the V-2 traveled faster than the speed of sound and gave no warning before impact. There was no effective defense and no risk of pilot and crew casualties. In comparison, in one 24-hour period during Operation Hurricane, the RAF dropped over 10,000 long tons of bombs on Brunswick and Duisburg, roughly equivalent to the amount of explosives that could be delivered by 10,000 V-2 rockets. With the war all but lost, regardless of the factory output of conventional weapons, the Nazis resorted to V-weapons as a tenuous last hope to influence the war militarily as an extension of their desire to punish their foes and most importantly to give hope to their supporters with their miracle weapon. If the V-2 had no effect on the outcome of the war, its value was in its ingenuity, which set the stage for the next 50 years of ballistic military rocketry, culminating in the ICBMs of the Cold War and in the beginnings of modern space exploration. Unfulfilled plans, a submarine towed launch platform was tested successfully, making it the prototype for submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The project codename was PRA 1 quarter FSTAND-12, sometimes called the rocket U-boat. If deployed, it would have allowed a U-boat to launch V-2 missiles against United States cities, though only with considerable effort. Hitler, in July 1944 and Speer, in January 1945, made speeches alluding to the scheme, though Germany did not possess the capability to fulfill these threats. These schemes were met by the Americans with Operation Teardrop. While interned after the war by the British at CSDIC Camp 11, Dornberger was recorded saying that he had begged the far one quarter rare to stop the V-weapon propaganda, because nothing more could be expected from one ton of explosive. To this Hitler had replied that Dornberger might not expect more, but he certainly did. According to decrypted messages from the Japanese embassy in Germany, 12 dismantled V-2 rockets were shipped to Japan. These left Bordeaux in August 1944 on the transport U-boats U-219 and U-195, which reached Jakarta in December 1944. A civilian V-2 expert was a passenger on U-234, bound for Japan in May 1945 when the war ended in Europe. The fate of these V-2 rockets is unknown. Post-war use, at the end of the war, a race began between the United States and the USSR to retrieve as many V-2 rockets and staff as possible. 300 railcar loads of V-2s and parts were captured and shipped to the United States and 126 of the principal designers, including Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger, were in American hands. Von Braun, his brother Magnus von Braun and seven others decided to surrender to the United States military to ensure they were not captured by the advancing Soviets or shot dead by the Nazis to prevent their capture. Britain In October 1945, British Operation Backfire assembled a small number of V-2 missiles and launched three of them from a site in northern Germany. The engineers involved had already agreed to move to the U.S. when the test firings were complete. The backfire report remains the most extensive technical documentation of the rocket, including all support procedures, tailored vehicles and fuel composition. Post-war V-2s launched in secret from PNM or one quarter NDE may have been responsible for a curious phenomenon known as ghost rockets, unexplained objects crossing the skies over Sweden and Finland. Canada, in his book My Father's Son, Canadian author Farley Mouat, then a member of the Canadian Army, 
claims to have obtained a V-2 rocket in 1945 and shipped it back to Canada, where it is alleged to have ended up in the Canadian National Exhibition Grounds in Toronto. There was a V-2 stored outside at RCAF Station Picton, Ontario in June 1961. The Canadian Arrow, a competitor for the Ansari X Prize, was based on the aerodynamic design of the V-2. United States Operation Paperclip recruited German engineers and Special Mission V-2 transported the captured V-2 parts to the United States. At the close of the Second World War, over 300 rail cars filled with V-2 engines, fuselages, propellant tanks, gyroscopes, and associated equipment were brought to the rail yards in Las Cruces, New Mexico, so they could be placed on trucks and driven to the White Sands Proving Grounds, also in New Mexico. In addition to V-2 hardware, the U.S. government delivered German mechanization equations for the V-2 guidance, navigation, and control systems, as well as for advanced development concept vehicles, to U.S. defense contractors for analysis. In the 1950s some of these documents were useful to U.S. contractors in developing direction cosine matrix transformations and other inertial navigation architecture concepts that were applied to early U.S. programs such as the Atlas and Minuteman guidance systems as well as the Navy's subs inertial navigation system. A committee was formed with military and civilian scientists to review payload proposals for the reassembled V-2 rockets. This led to an eclectic array of experiments that flew on V-2s and paved the way for American manned space exploration. Devices were sent aloft to sample the air at all levels to determine atmospheric pressures and to see what gases were present. Other instruments measured the level of cosmic radiation. Only 68% of the V-2 trials were considered successful. A supposed V-2 launched on May 29, 1947 landed near Juarez. Mexico and was actually a Hermes B-1 vehicle. The U.S. Navy attempted to launch a German V-2 rocket at Sci Euro 1 test launch from the aircraft carrier USS Midway was performed on September 6, 1947 as part of the Navy's Operation Sandy. The test launch was a partial success. The V-2 went off the pad but splashed down in the ocean only some 10 km from the carrier. The launch setup on the Midway's deck is notable in that it used fold-away arms to prevent the missile from falling over. The arms pulled away just after the engine ignited, releasing the missile. The setup may look similar to the R-7 launch procedure but in the case of the R-7 the trusses hold the full weight of the rocket, rather than just reacting to side forces. The PGM-11 Redstone rocket is a direct descend into the V-2. USSR the USSR also captured a number of V-2s and staff, letting them set up in Germany for a time. The first work contracts were signed in the middle of 1945. In 1946 they were obliged to move to Kapustin Yar in the USSR, where Gra Paragraph TTOUP headed up a group of just under 250 engineers. The first Soviet missile was the A-1, a duplicate of the V-2. Most of the German team was sent home after that project but some remained to do research until as late as 1951. Unbeknownst to the Germans, work immediately began on larger missiles, the Adu and R-5, based on extension of the V-2 technology. In popular culture, Thomas Pankin makes the V-2 rocket the central point of his postmodern novel Gravity's Rainbow. The MGM movie Operation Crossbow dramatizes Allied efforts to impede the V-1 and V-2 programs. In Command and Conquer, Red Alert, which takes place in an alternate time period, the Soviet Red Army uses V-2 rockets that are launched via trucks against Allied nations. In the game Medal of Honor, the player has to sabotage and launch a V-2 rocket in the last mission. In Sniper Elite V-2, the player has to sabotage the launch of V-2 rocket, by shooting the fuel tank in a few seconds before the launch. Surviving V-2 Examples and Components At least 20 V-2s still existed in 2014. Australia, one at the Australian War Memorial, Canberra, including complete Miller Wagon Transporter. The rocket has the most complete set of guidance components of all surviving A-4S. The Myler Wagon is the most complete of the three examples known to exist. Another A4 was on display at the RAAF Museum at Point Cook outside Melbourne. 
both rockets now reside in Canberra. Netherlands, one example, partly skeletonized, is in the collection of the Royal Netherlands Army Museum. In this collection are also a launching table and some loose parts, as well as the remains of a V-2 that crashed in The Hague immediately after launch. Poland, several large components, like hydrogen peroxide tank and reaction chamber, the propellant turbo pump and the HWK rocket engine chamber are displayed at the Polish Aviation Museum in Kraka Cube W, France, one engine at CETA copyright Dull Space in Toulouse, V2 display including engine, parts, rocket body and many documents and photographs relating to the development and use at La Coupole Museum, Wise Errands, Par de Calais. One rocket body no engine, one complete engine, one lower engine section and one wrecked engine on display at La Coupole Museum, one engine complete with steering pallets, feed lines and tank bottoms, plus one cutout thrust chamber and one cutout turbo pump at the Snecma Museum in Vernon, Germany, one complete missile and an additional engine at the Deutsches Museum in Munich, one engine at the German Museum of Technology in Berlin. One rusty engine in the original V-2 underground production facilities at the Dora Mittelbau concentration camp memorial site. One replica was constructed for the PNEMA one quarter NDE Historical and Technical Information Center where it is displayed near what remains of the factory where it was built. United Kingdom. One at the Science Museum, London. One, on loan from Cranfield University, at the Imperial War Museum, London. The RAF Museum has two rockets, one displayed at the museum's London site and one at the Cusford site. The museum also owns a Mylar wagon, a Vidalogen, a Strabo crane, and a firing table with towing dolly. One at the Royal Engineers Museum in Chatham, Kent. A fuel combustion chamber from a fired example is in Norfolk and Suffolk Aviation Museum near Bungay. A complete turbo pump is at Solway Aviation Museum. Kalal Airport as part of the Blue Streak rocket exhibition. The Venturi segment of one discovered in April 2012 was donated to the Harwich Sailing Club after they found it buried in a mud flat. Fuel combustion chamber recovered from the sea near Clacton at the East Essex Aviation Museum, St. Oist, United States, complete missiles, one at the Flying Heritage Collection, Everett, Washington, one at the National Museum of the United States Air Force including complete Mylar Wagon, Dayton, Ohio. One at the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Hutchinson, Kansas. One at the National Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C. One at the Fort Bliss Air Defense Museum, El Paso, Texas. One at Missile Park, White Sands Missile Range, White Sands, New Mexico. One at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. One at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Components, one engine at the Stafford Air and Space Museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma. One engine at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. One engine at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. One engine at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. One rocket body and one engine at the United States Army Ordnance Museum in Aberdeen. Maryland. One rocket body at Picatinny Arsenal and Dover, NJ. One engine in the Auburn University Engineering Lab, one engine in the Blockhouse Building on the historic Cape Canaveral Tour in Cape Canaveral, Florida. One engine at Parks College of Engineering, Aviation and Technology in St. Louis, Missouri. One engine and tail section at New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo, New Mexico. See also. Rocket V-2, the third bridge operation, July 1944, aggregate, V-1 flying bomb, notes. References. External links, V-2 rocket support vehicles at longacentury.com, Rocket V-2, the third bridge operation, July 1944, V-2 heavy sight imagery, National Collection of Aerial Photography, PBS, The Hunt for Nazi Scientists. History of PNEMA 1 quarter NDE and the discovery of the German missile development by the Allies, about effect of V-2s on London, German V-2 per a 4 test range in Tuckola Forest today, Dora and the Vajero 2 a Euro slave labor in the space age, 
v 2 rocketcom Shoot Saves Rockets Secrets. September 1947, Popular Science Article on U.S. Use of V-2 for Scientific Research, Video of Operation Backfire, WWII, the German V-2 rocket on YouTube, Video Showing Assembly and Launch Procedure. Reconstruction, Restoration and Refurbishment of a V-2 Rocket, Spherical Panoramas of the Process and Milestones.